Welcome to one and all. I am Anushka Dadi, studying in second year B.Tech, Dice of Technology at ICT. On behalf of Bombay Technologists, it is my extreme honor to be interviewing a legendary person, Dr. Raghunath Mashalkar, Chancellor of Institute of Chemical Technology. Dr. Raghunath Mashalkar is one of India's most eminent scientists. He is known for his contributions to India's National Chemical Laboratory and Council of Scientific and Industrial Research multiple martial care committees and a successful campaign against foreign patents on Indian traditional knowledge. His mantras of inclusive innovation, more from less for more, and Gandhian engineering have been a constant source of inspiration for corporates and youth alike. He pursued his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Udicity, now known as ICT. He completed his PhD under the guidance of Professor Sharma, finishing his thesis in just three years. His outstanding work earned him a fellowship at Salford University. Dr. Marshall Kerr has played a critical role in, in shaping India's science and technological policy. He was a member of Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister and also to the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Cabinet set up by successive governments. His contributions to the nation and to science at large have been honored by a plethora of awards. The most significant being the Padma Vibhushan, the Padma Bhushan, and the Padma Shri. He's the third Indian engineer to be inducted as a fellow of Royal Society UK and the first Indian to be elected as a fellow of National Academy of Inventors US. He's the president of the Global Research Alliance and also the chairperson of the National Innovation Foundation of India. He's an ambassador and preacher for innovation and R&D across the world and serves on the board of many leading companies. Dear sir, it is a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure and privilege is entirely mine. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely delighted uh, to not only have this particular conversation, uh, but have it with uh, the next generation. Uh, people like uh, uh, you and uh, uh, Ekata, uh, it's a very, very special place indeed. So let's begin. Yes, sir. Let's begin with our questions. Uh, you chose chemical engineering as a career. On reflection, what do you think is the current standing of chemical engineering among all other branches of engineering? And what do you think is the future of the same? Oh, yes, that's a very good question uh, to start with. Uh, well, all branches of engineering are important. There is no question about that. I would say when we talk about chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there is only one engineering that matters. It is called solution engineering. All right. So humanity has certain problems. Society has problems. Industry has problems. How do you solve them? Okay, so all branches of engineering actually contribute to that. Now, in terms of chemical engineering, of course, we deal with chemical industry and allied industries, because when we look at polymers, I look at them as chemicals, or biomolecules, they're also chemicals, right, in, in some form or the other. I think what is uh, very special about chemical engineering is uh, it's a uh, vast uh, sort of expands in terms of the time scales that it deals with, as well as the size scales it deals with. So in terms of size, for example, right from molecular level to atmospheric level, okay, one end to the other, we go. It's the same thing in terms of uh, size scales and so on and so forth. Uh, reactors happen to be the intermediate scale, but uh, the uh, chemical engineer span uh, the, the whole molecular uh, uh, scale to mesoscale, so as to say. That's one. The second it is uh, the word chemical engineering science was coined the earliest. You know, you did not hear about mechanical engineering science or electrical engineering science, etc. But chemical engineering science, in fact, came out as a journal a long, long uh, ago. Because the interface of uh, chemical engineering and allied sciences, 
uh, was known. In fact, I have given a what is called as a Dankworth's Memorial Lecture, and the title of it was "Borderless Chemical in Sand." This was given in London in early 90s, and there I bring out how the interface between the two is actually changing uh, very, very uh, rapidly. Uh, the other important part is the importance of chemical fuel. You know, in the 20th century, uh, when it was coming to an end, uh, it was asked, uh, uh, there was an opinion poll about uh, what is the most important breakthrough and discovery in the 20th century. Now, you would have thought it could be internet, you, this, that, and the other, etc. No. People talked about Heberbosch process. And why that was important? Because that could create ammonia and therefore ammonical fertilizers, and therefore the growing population uh, could actually be fed. Otherwise, uh, we would not have had the food. All right. You and I would not have been there because fertilizers have not come at that time because our forefathers would not have. Now there, for example, uh, you will uh, find that Heber, this German chemist, had actually done the chemical process of fixing uh, uh, atmospheric uh, nitrogen. That was in 1909. But chemistry was fine. Finally, it had to be a chemical technology and, and a proper a sort of plant, and that was done at BASF by Bosch, for example, in 1913, the entire uh, chemical process. So that is where the role of chemical engineering actually comes, all right? And it has been important. Would it be important in the 21st century? I would say even more, because the whole world, just as we survived and grew uh, because we had a food, similarly, now the question is, if uh, the dangers of climate change uh, that are looming large, are not taken care of, will they survive at all? So there is a question of survival uh, in the past, in the 20th century, there is a question of survival uh, uh, of the future in the 21st century. And that survival is uh, going to again depend upon temperatures. I mean, today uh, we talk about uh, uh, green hydrogen, for example, all right, as a fuel of the future. All right, because we don't want um, uh, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, challenge that we have, which is uh, uh, leading to sort of global warming. So we need to fix it. You need a chemical engineer. Uh, you uh, need uh, an electrolyzer to split water, for example, by using solar electricity to make it green. You require a chemical engineer. You want to create uh, storage. Uh, basically, you require a chemical engineer. So I think the short answer to me, uh, to, to, to your question, is that yes, it is going to be the most important uh, field uh, in coming years. Yes, sir, it was truly insightful. Uh, so you entered ICT, which was then known as Udicity, in the year 1962 as a first chemical engineering student. Would you have then believed that one day you will become the chancellor of your own alma mater, how do you see the journey of ICT so far? And if you were to maybe uh, summarize your top three wishes, what would they be for ICT? Oh, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. I would uh, put it this way: in 1962, uh, <clears throat> when I entered, if somebody had told me that I would become uh, uh, the chancellor, I would not have believed it. It is. Uh, uh, almost uh, impossible. But I'm very proud, uh, actually, that uh, uh, the Institute uh, uh, thought that I was worthy of this uh, honor. And I have really enjoyed uh, uh, this as probably the best honor that I've received in my life. To be the chancellor of your alma mater, there cannot be anything better. Than and what alma mater it is? Udicity, as we used to know, was a, just a department of chemical technology at that point in time. And from that, we got uh, the autonomous status, you know, uh, Mumbai University of History of Chemical Technology, right? And the first governing board was that was uh, formed in 2008. I was privileged to be the chairman of that board. And uh, I remember a uh, very prestigious board with people like Mukesh Ambani, 
uh, being a member of the board, etc. And uh, then, of course, uh, we uh, got the autonomous status. We were the first uh, institute to be, uh, I mean, deemed university status. We were the first institute to be uh, declared as a sort of an elite institution, center of excellence status, etc. So we have only grown from a department to a great uh, institution. Of course, there is a journey ahead. Now, you ask me about um, uh, ICT journey, etc. Look, I've been very fortunate to have great leadership, right from Dr. Venkatraman to, to just uh, look at, uh, and of course, uh, Professor M. M. Sharma, is a living legend, basically. We had the fortune of that. And uh, the directors were followed I mean, his students, basically, as you can quite clearly see. And I'm quite sure the students, students will continue to be the chancellor. So, so we have this tradition, that is first. The second part I would like to say about ICT is that it combines excellence and relevance. Excellence in terms of the quality of scientific research that one does and relevance in terms of application to industry, industrial enterprises, creating industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a record, it's actually unparalleled. And the nation recognizes it. Just last year, for example, 2020, uh, when the nation started recognizing institutions on the basis of innovation, the so-called utter ranking of institutes, uh, we were the first, uh, ranked the first. Or uh, if you look at 2021 and NAC uh, sort of uh, this recognition, the top three in Maharashtra, our institute, TIFR and Tata Institute of Science. So we have been always uh, sort of uh, at the top. I think most importantly, I think and any institute is ju uh, judged by the products that it creates and the products are the graduates. Okay. And what products we have created, which is absolutely uh, amazing, you know. Uh, we have received honors like three Padma Bhushans, eight Padma Bhushans, ten Padma Shri's. And in terms of science, for example, uh, the first fellow of Royal Society in the 20th century was Professor M.M. Sharma, right? And in 360 years, there have been only two uh, chemical engineers who have become fellow of Royal Society which is considered as one of the highest honors. Uh, one happens to be Professor Sharma, and second happens to be his student who is talking to you. That is me, all right? Now, you can't have anything sort of uh, better than that. Look at honors like National Academy of Engineering. We probably uh, is, uh, have the best chemical engineering uh, department in the world with highest number of National Academy of Engineering fellows, uh, either current or past, I mean, Professor Sharma, Myself and uh, uh, Professor J.B. Joshi. Uh, then we had, this year we had uh, uh, Professor G.D. Yadav and of course uh, Mukesh Ambani. Five of them. No other department has such a. So I think we have done uh, extremely well in terms of. Also, we have given uh, leaders outside. I mean, if you just see our students. They have uh, gone on to become uh, great leaders. I mean, look at uh, A.V. Ramarao, he became Indian Minister of Chemical Technologies uh, Director. Uh, you look at R. Krishna, he was Indian Minister of Petroleum Director. You look at Dr. Anji Reddy, who created a great enterprise. And of course, uh, the, the, the uh, actually legendary uh, Mukesh Ambani, uh, you know, I mean, he had been our uh, KK Kharada, for example and so on and so forth. So I think I would judge uh, the impact that ICT has made so far in terms of not only what research it has done, but also in terms of the kind of uh, products that it has created as outstanding uh, sort of uh, uh, alumni. Now you asked me a very difficult question, what is my wish? So uh, you have to take it uh, in the following way. I always uh, uh, say that aspirations are your possibilities. You have to aim high. And my first uh, aspiration is that we moved from a department to an autonomous institute to a deemed university. 
right? We have to become central university. Okay, that would be my first wish. The second is in terms of our research, we have to raise the bar. Because they say in science only two people are remembered. Those who say the first word in science and say the last word in science. Okay. And therefore, I think what we do should not just be incremental or derivative. We have to open new doors because what happens is that many times others open the doors or windows and then we look through them. Bidnos and Mueller uh, uh, did uh, the room temperature superconductor breakthrough. Then all of us worked on it. Then we had the breakthrough on graphene, which got the Nobel Prize. We all started working on carbon nanotubes. What I would like to see is that equivalent of these breakthroughs come from um, our institute, all right? So that's uh, my second question. The third is ICT contains an I, that I is very important. That I must stand for innovation and not just incremental innovation, disruptive innovation, game changing. That I must stand for integration, integration of diverse disciplines. We have to become truly interdisciplinary. Like for example, I'm happy that we have started uh, uh, taking the first steps in biological sciences, but the interface between biology and chemistry and other disciplines, breakthroughs will take place at the interfaces. So we have to go more sort of uh, interdisciplinary in terms of the uh, integration. And finally, for a country like India, what is most important is inclusion. Inclusion in a sense, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the they say that making high technology work for rich is very easy, but making high technology work for the poor is very difficult. So we have to actually create technological solutions for India's problems. Basically, you know, where mass at large uh, sort of benefits. So I would simply say that my wish list is Central University, number one. Number two, breakthrough research, first to the world, not first to India. And third, the I in ICT must stand for innovation of the highest level, integration of the highest level, and inclusion, which benefits entirely. Sir, I really hope our institution conquers these wishes of yours. Um, so moving on, you had your baptism by fire when you were just 42 years old. When uh, the Bhopal tragedy took place, leading to emission of poisonous gases, it became the worst ever disaster in chemical industry, indeed, indeed in human history, with thousands losing their lives overnight. And then the government appointed you as the technical assessor for the one-man inquiry commission. That must have been a huge, huge challenge for you. How did you deal with this? Yes, I think uh, uh, but that, that was a huge challenge because I was born in 43. So if you look at the accident uh, in, uh, uh, that took place on uh, the midnight of 2nd December, 2-3 December 1984, I was, uh, I'm not even touched 41, you know, and uh, to get, uh, such an awesome responsibility uh, was, was a great experience uh, for me, I must say. Well, what I recall is the following. I remember I was uh, holidaying with uh, my wife in uh, Chennai uh, and uh, this accident took place and then I was called to the accident uh, uh, sort of site, just as others were also called. And the reason was that the way the accident took place was that uh, this methyl isocyanate, uh, in the liquid form, was stored in three tanks. I still remember there were uh, E610, 611, and 619. And out of the 610, uh, the MIC uh, sort of leaked out. And uh, 40 tons. Uh, uh, were stored there, and 30 tons just were released in 60 minutes. Nobody knew why that has happened as a matter of fact. And then overnight, 2,600 people died. The numbers vary, uh, the estimates vary from anywhere from that number to 8,000, but we still are not very clear. But thousands died. Uh, but equally importantly, thousands are still suffering uh, long after uh, 
uh, briefing. So it was words, uh, worst uh, chemical disaster, there was no doubt about that. And then uh, the, there were two challenges. The first was there was methyl isocyanate in other tanks, which was stored. Okay. So would they also just go up suddenly? Uh, what do we do? And for that, uh, there was a group of us, uh, Dr. Sharma was also there, uh, Dr. Tyagrajan, so many others, Dr. Vardarajan was sort of leading it. So we all had to sit together and then finally what is called as operation faith that was done. And we thought that the same process which uses uh, it to produce carburin would be, that's the first. And then the second, there was an inquiry commission, one man inquiry commission. And I was appointed as a technical assessor. And we had to find the causes. And that was a huge challenge, as a matter of fact, you know. And there was a very uh, uh, intricate analysis, and CSR took the responsibility at that time. And I'm very proud that uh, NCF, because I was working at National Chemical Laboratory at that time. I was uh, head of the chemical engineering department. Uh, so uh, we uh, took that challenge, and then we had uh, 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 the uh, Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, which we call as RR. Uh, plus, we took the help of uh, others and uh, uh, then did the analysis. I must uh, recognize here it was a very complex uh, accident because uh, water had entered the tank. Okay and the reaction between methyl isocyanate and water took place. And uh, normally, if the reaction had taken place, uh, nothing much would have happened. I mean, as you know, CS3 and CO plus S2 is equal to CS3 and S2 plus CO2. So methyl amine would have just uh, sort of come out. No, it did not. But all of the tanks contained came. So it was a bit of an intrigue. And we found, as a matter of fact, that uh, methyl isocyanate uh, has uh, the propensity to trimerize three molecules come together. And that is very exothermic, you know, 59 kilocalories per mole. And just imagine that that tank was buried underneath, okay? And you get water inside and then uh, this uh, autothermal reaction starts. And then also things would not have been done, excepting that the tanks all were corroded and they formed FECL3, which we found out by analysis of the tank content. And that uh, uh, catalytic autothermal reaction actually uh, led uh, to violent, uh, uh, let us say, uh, I mean, you can just imagine uh, almost. Uh, mixing taking place by bubbling because the gas was getting generated. So you have well mixed uh, uh, reactor uh, under adiabatic conditions because the heat cannot go out because it is uh, sort of buried. And that is how the, And we have done a perfect analysis to show that uh, what were the cause because of which uh, a sort of this accident took place because there's a theory being propagated that's a sabotage. And there was a water that was put in by some disgruntled employee. That is not the case. That is obvious because the employee would not have known what are the, um, the, 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 the tanks wall, uh, walls were corroded because it was not open for several years. And if that corrosion had not taken place, uh, such a disastrous consequence of leaking so many uh, tons of gases would not have taken place. So that was debunked by us. And that was very important from. Uh, India's perspective in our report. So I would say that I, I remember the contributions of so many of them, including Dr. B.D. Kulkarni, who is no more, in terms of modeling, simulation, and so on and so forth. So this was my first exposure uh, to an accident and accident analysis. And later on, of course, uh, the second worst accident, Maharashtra gas cracker complex at Nagurtne, there were 32 people died in terms of explosion. Uh, there also the government thought it wise to make a committee under my chairmanship. So countries, two worst chemical disasters. Uh, I, I've been associated with them, not in causing them, but in terms of analyzing them 
and so on and so forth. So yes, the answer to your question is that it was a very uh, uh, sort of fascinating experience for a young man in his early 40s. Truly, sir. Uh, so you pioneered the concept of Gandhian engineering, giving us a new terminology, MLM, that is uh, more from less for more. And then you promoted it by setting up Anjani Mashelkar Inclusive Innovation Award in your mother's name. What triggered this very idea in your mind in the first place? And how important is it for the world of today and tomorrow? Yeah, that's a very good question because uh, it is very interesting. We know there is nothing like a course on gun engineering as we know. We have chemical engineering, metallurgical engineering, Aeronautical engineering, computer engineering, but no Gandhi engineer. Uh, how did I coin that term? See, 2008, I remember uh, uh, I was uh, uh, invited uh, to Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, uh, because I was elected as a fellow of uh, uh, Australian uh, Academy of Technology and engineering, uh, technological science and engineering. And uh, I was the first Indian to have been invited. So I said uh, to myself that uh, since they have invited me, they don't know India, because there were a hundred others that I could say were better than me. So I decided to talk to them about something that they uh, would not know. So I titled this a Gandhi engineering. And uh, why did I use the words of uh, Mahatma Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi had said, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. What do you mean by that? Come on, the resources that you have, which are exhausted and not renewable, please use them carefully so that you can preserve them for next generation, the following generation. That means get more from this. Right? And then Mahatma Gandhi had also said that uh, uh, the results of science must benefit all the population. So that means more and more people, all right? not just a few. So more from less for more became the MNM, more from less for more. And then I illustrated it, why it was important. And this was different because when we say more from less, the world was used to more from more. What it means that supposing you have a gadget like this and you want to create a better iPhone, you'll make it more expensive, put more feature. That is more from more. As far as the poor are concerned, we're giving them less for less. Oh, they are poor, they can't afford, so give them something. So I said, no, it is more from less for more and more people. That means making high technology work for the poor, not just low tech. Now, that was an interesting challenge. And then it became very popular, got picked up. I spoke in around 25 uh, different cities in the world about this particular concept. In fact, World Economic Forum was so impressed that uh, within six months, uh, and then what happened was that with CK Pranad, I wrote a paper in Harvard Business Review in July, August. 2010 on more from less for more as a new innovation paradigm. Innovation's holy grail, we called it. And that is now ranked among the top 10 must read papers, so as to say. So Gandhi engineering got propagated sort of all over uh, uh, the world. Uh, now you asked me a question about uh, my setting up uh, these Gandhi engineering awards. So I call them uh, I, uh, my mother always used to tell me that you must do science which can help the poor. When she passed away, I created a foundation in her name. It is called Anjani Mashenkar Inclusive Innovation Awards. We started giving those awards. And those awards are sort of uh, incredible in a sense. Uh, for example, uh, ECG. If you want to have ECG, what will you do? You go to the hospital, lie down, do 12 leads, okay? And then it will take half an hour and then the nurse will give you a printout, etc. And it will cost you some money. Can you just imagine having a portable ECG which you can put in your pocket, which can be used even in the village? It looks impossible, no. 
but here it is. All right. This is called Sanket, created by Rahul Rastu. And two lakh of these devices have been sold in eight countries now. Now, what is this? Well, you have these uh, two sensors. You put your two thumbs here for 15 seconds. Then this is your heart. So there is a sensor here. You put it above the heart, then below the heart, 15 seconds each. And if you have downloaded uh, an app called Sanket, the ECG go directly there. What does it mean? That means there's a poor woman, let us say, in a village, and she has heartache, pain. Then she doesn't have to be put in a bullock cart or a motorcycle or a jeep and taken a few kilometers. Right there, you can do this. This is simple. Okay? And the cost will be just five rupees. This is Gandhi engineering because this is high tech working for, uh, uh, for the poor. So similarly, there are other awardees like uh, breast cancer. You know, you have very painful uh, uh, process, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, etc. You don't have to do that. There's a device which you just move around and within $1 for a scan, uh, this is called iBreast created by Misha. You know whether you have cancer. The last award that we gave this year is for oral cancer. Uh, there is a small device which is like a toothbrush that you move and you know whether you have oral cancer or you know, uh, things of that. Uh, so these are uh, uh, sort of, in fact, there is just a cover page story on in civil society describing all these because these are all important because they are all diagnostics, which are first of all, non-invasive. So you don't require experts. Secondly, they are affordable, very cheap, like I said. Thirdly, they all use high tech, you know? So it can make a big difference to the sort of uh, 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 poor population. So this has become very popular. Now your question was how important it is for the, uh, for the world. Very, very important. Because as you could see after pandemic, more people have become poor, basically. People have been thrown from poverty to extreme poverty. And therefore, we must give access equality despite income inequality. Inequalities have increased considerably. And that is where Gandhi engineering comes. You know, like today, if you look at uh, uh, Jio, what ha has it done? Voice free and data for rupees per GB and very cheap phones. So I saw on the other day, uh, sort of uh, a lady sweeping the road uh, with one broom and mobile on the other. Could you have imagined that? In my time, I remember when I came in 1976, uh, I had to wait for six years to get a telephone. Now here, uh, uh, sort of this is the new, this is all done in general, getting access to the poorest of the poor of the best technology. So you valiantly fought and revoked the wrong U.S. patents on turmeric and basmati rice based on India's traditional knowledge. What led to this interest in the patents involving um, turmeric and basmati rice as their basic elements used in our diet? Well, uh, why did I do that? Yes, uh, that's the interesting part. I uh, remember uh, I was in Delhi as a DJ of CSR. I was in Delhi and... Uh, I was reading Times of India and I saw that uh, US had taken patent on wound healing properties of turmeric. And suddenly I remembered uh, my mother, you know, who, uh, when there was a bird who uh, so, sort of died in front of us on our terrace. And she had gone down and applied uh, haldi, uh, the paste of haldi to that bird. I suddenly remember, I said, my mother knows it. My mother's mother is an old knowledge. How can they take a patent? And I challenge it. And uh, that was a matter of principle that you can't uh, take patents on things that, that is well known for centuries. And then, uh, of course, that went into sort of it had a great impact, as a matter of fact, because uh, traditional knowledge was not at all recognized as knowledge. Okay. Uh, there was this word intellectual property organization, WIPO, with 176 nations as members. 
and I became the chairman of Standing Committee on Information Technology for two and a half years. And at that point in time, I challenged them. I said, the knowledge generated in your laboratories in Harvard, Caltech, Princeton is knowledge. And knowledge generated by my ancestors in laboratories of life is no knowledge. How can that be? And that is where there was an awakening that that has to be also incorporated. So there is a long process that was followed. And finally, traditional knowledge got recognition sort of all over. And then we created traditional knowledge digital library. It was, uh, all that knowledge was scattered. You know, it is uh, more than three crore pages, by the way. And now no wrong patterns as a result of that. Because patent examiners have to look at it first before they grant a patent and so on. Basmati was different, of course, because uh, a company in Texas actually had uh, uh, taken a patent uh, on a new variety that they had created. They called it Texmati. And uh, that would have created a problem in terms of our exports. All right. And thousands of crores we would have lost. So we fought that. I chaired that particular committee. And then that pattern began. But I think these cases like turmeric, basmati, neem, neem, I was not involved some years ago, actually brought a growing awareness to the rest of the world that traditional knowledge is as important as the knowledge that we have in former laboratories. Yes, so it was very interesting to hear about this. Um, you are known for your uh, transformative leadership, starting with your taking on as director of NCL. And we understand this uh, NCL transformation has found a place in Harvard University's case studies. Uh, could you tell us more about it? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, 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 this, uh, you know, Harvard uh, has a course on entrepreneurs in emerging economies. And Professor Tarun Khanna gives it. And uh, he has used NCL case study. What was special about NCL? You know, in 1989, when I took over, this was two years before liberalization. What, uh, we were a protected country. So we were doing reverse engineering, we were copying. Okay. And uh, the, uh, challenge was uh, that any time NCL did something which was ahead of the rest of the world and we went to Indian industry, they're hesitant. They would say, but has Japan done it? Has US done it? Has Europe done it? Whatever, then how can you do it? So I said uh, on the very first day when I addressed NCL staff that look, why should we be national game? We should be international. The new knowledge breakthrough that we generate, they have market abroad. Why India? And then we went into patenting because I said not publish or perish, patent, publish and prosper. You know, many people call me not Mashelkar but patent curve because then I pursued that vigorously all across the country. And then we created US patents which uh, were licensed to even the leaders like General Electric, Polycarbonate uh, patents, uh, Dr. Subram and his group sort of created them. And same laboratory, which are just doing copying, reverse engineering, import substitution. Once we raised the bar, they rose to the occasion. And I remember in 92, there were three US patents that were licensed to General Electric for a million dollars. That was the first reverse transfer of technology. In a sense, we were always begging and getting technology or copying. Rather than that, we said, here is our technology, which we can license to. That was a paradigm shift. So that was that national chemical laboratory to international chemical. And of course, it had spin-out effect because uh, the whole culture changed. And then within CSR, we changed that. Across the country, we changed that, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, that was a, a very important milestone in India's science technology journey. Yes, sir, truly, this was 
very great and so you were the de- then director journal of csir which is a chain of 40 national research laboratories and the transformation that you lead finds a place in the top 10 achievements of indian science and technology in professor jayant narlikar's book scientific edge so when you turn around transform 40 labs it must be a very tough task can you explain the secret behind this great feat of leadership oh yes <laughs> Well, CSR, we have 40 wonderful individual labs, uh, National Chemical Laboratory, National Physical Laboratory, National Aeronautical Laboratory, like that, you know. And it has done sort of a great work over a period of time. Uh, the challenge when I took over was uh, that each lab was like an individual lab, an entity, you know. Only two labs talk to each other and that's so on. So, so, you know, when you partner, you don't make one plus one equal to two. You make one plus one equal to 11. So building that team CSR spirit was extremely important. And that transformation actually required, first of all, ownership from each laboratory. So I remember I visited 40 laboratories across the country within one year, by the way. That was a kind of a record for any DG. And talked to them about the grand vision that we can all sort of, uh, uh, you know, what we can do in terms of uh, uh, making ourselves a performance-driven organization and so on. And that vision document, Vision 2003, became the rallying point. You know, uh, what happens is that take a piece of paper, okay, and put magnetic needles on them. They're, they're all scattered in all directions. Then you bring a magnet. What happens? They all get aligned. So similarly, once we gave a vision, you know, it is almost like uh, John F. Kennedy saying, man on the moon, and then the whole nation gears up. It, in a similar way, and same thing in India, we have done our political leaders have given a sort of a great vision, like uh, of, uh, our uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, when he talked about Swaj Bharat, for example, he said, within five years, we should be efficient free, and the entire country rose uh, to that. So same thing happened with CSR. And when I was, uh, when I joined CSR, when two labs were not talking to each other, by the time I left, there were programs where as many as 19 laboratories were working together as stream CSR. That is why this has been recognized as a major transformation. And uh, even World Bank has used uh, the kind of models that we had uh, for transforming laboratories in other parts of the world. So one feels very really satisfied about it. Yes, so that's really great. Uh, so you are known for your science, science leadership, but also for a record number of Marshallkar committees. In fact, uh, we, we heard somebody say in light of vain that when in difficulty, the government sets up Marshallkar committees. Can you tell us about these committees and what uh, national issues and challenges you had to deal with? Yeah, that's uh, very, of course, that's a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but uh, uh, it has happened as you, uh, as uh, uh, there are 16 mutual committees so far, by the way, on different aspects as a matter of fact. Uh, for example, in 1998, uh, at a central level, of course, I told you about Bhopal disaster or Maharashtra gas cracker complex. That was kind of a different thing, right? There were accidents. But my first uh, Marshall Committee was 1998. When the regional engineering colleges then, government wanted to uh, sort of review them. And I remember our recommending that in what way those students are inferior to IIT students. Because as you know, uh, here, one in 100 gets into IIT, but for that one, there may be five or 10 as good. It depends upon on that day, what mark you get. Your one mark here and there can shift you by 100 ranks, basically. So they were very good students and they will contribute. So we said they should be National Institute of Technology and been given, and as you know, we were 19 at that time. Now there are uh, over 35, uh, NITs and some of the NITs are doing better than IITs. So that was my first company. The latest has been, of course, for our Maharashtra, the 
new education policy 2020 you know uh, there is a roadmap that had to be created i was the chairman of the task force and i'm very happy uh, to see that that has been taken very seriously approved by the cabinet and the chief minister himself is chairing the implementation committee so this has been fascinating it gives you a great joy uh, to uh, make a difference uh, in different ways not only doing science or science leadership but also in policy yes yeah, so that is really great to hear uh, sir, you have been a member of Science Advisory Council uh, to the Prime Minister and also Prime Minister's National Innovation Council. How do you see the progress that Indian science, technology and innovation has done over the years? And how can India reinvent itself as a leader in the country of nations? Oh, that's a very good question. Yes, I became a member of Science Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister uh, at the young age of 42. So that itself was uh, sort of great because uh, uh, I got what you might like to call, you know, I was involved with NCL. I was a head of the chemistry department, uh, just restricted my view to uh, chemical engineering and nothing more than that. But when I became member of science and medical committee, the prime minister, suddenly you got a helicopter's view or you go to 30,000 feet view. So I uh, am grateful to the nation that they gave me that opportunity. And then it continued for 30 years in uh, various uh, forms. Uh, as regards to your question in terms of uh, the progress that we have made, oh, we have progressed a lot. There is no question about it. See, uh, we have done things under very difficult circumstances. I mean, take, uh, for example, access to supercomputers. We didn't have them. So I remember I was a member of Science Advisory Committee of the Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's time. And uh, he asked us, uh, we are a poor country. We can't do everything. What are we good at? So I, I remember Professor Rutan Nasima, who is no more. He said, we are good at this. What does it mean? Then this parallel processing based uh, architecture with supercomputers was just coming the high performance. And he said, we can do that and take a leadership. And I remember, again, it was a trust. Uh, we were given $10 million, which are 35 crore at that time. And three years in which to do it. And Dr. Vijay Bhattar did it, basically. Okay? And that had its own impact. Because after a few years, uh, the same company which had uh, denied us, the computer wanted to do it. You, you, you get the point. So there, there is this denial-driven uh, innovation. So we have done that in uh, nuclear energy, uh, in space, uh, in atomic energy, everywhere. We were denied technology and we would simply say thank you very much and do it. Like cryogenic engine was denied to us. We said thank you very much and we did our own. Then everybody came sort of... Uh, uh, so that's a, that's a great story. As far as basic science is concerned, also the quality has gone up, the numbers have gone up, et cetera, et cetera. They, and and a satisfaction, we are now number three in the world uh, in terms of the purpose. Uh, although I say this, I must also say that uh, there was a point in time when China and us, if we compare, we were ahead of China. Now China is way, 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 way ahead. Like when uh, Dr. Vijay Bhatkar came out with Param 10,000 in 1998, we were ahead of China. But today, if you look at the 500 top supercomputers in the world, China has 220 plus, and we are 220 plus versus four. Whereas we are, so there are a number of areas where they have uh, gone way ahead of us. Uh, consider patterns, for example. I remember in 2002, they had listed the PCT filing, Patent Cooperation Treaty filing list. Who was number one? CSI. Okay. Who was number two? Samsung. Third, LG. And fourth, the Chinese company UI. This was 2002. So we were way ahead of everybody. They, UIA is number one 
not only in Asia, but in the world. So my lament is that uh, uh, we have progressed, but others have gone so far ahead. That's the issue. And we need to sort of uh, accelerate that. Uh, by, uh, there are several means by which this can be done. I have publicly spoken about it. And finally, most importantly, that uh, breakthroughs, as I mentioned a little earlier, saying the first word in science. Uh, science must solve, technology must transform, and innovation must impact. In inclusive innovation, uh, like the Gandhi regime that I talked about, nobody beats us. We are number one. Okay, But I would like to see uh, India's rank in innovation sort of improve. Like China is number 12 today, and we are 48. You, you get the point. So that distance is what sort of bothers me. I'm not comparing with small countries like Finland. We can only compare with big countries, like with like, apples with apples, all right? And I think that we need to solve. But uh, uh, we depend upon the young generation like yours uh, to give us that feeling in time to come. I have complete trust in you that you will do it. I really hope we live up to that trust of yours. Uh, so let's move to pandemic. So as we know, it has led to devastation in terms of loss of both lives and livelihoods. What lessons has it taught us? And online learning, which was on periphery, has suddenly become the new norm. And our institution, ICT itself, had a big challenge. How did we deal with this? And how do you think the future education uh, systems will undergo a change? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very important question. Well, pandemic has taught us many lessons. First of all, it caused devastation uh, of lives, of livelihoods. And, uh, but it also did other things. Like, for example, overnight, 1.6 billion children were thrown out of school. Okay? And there's no other way but online learning. But one third of them did not have access to digital devices. Okay. So that caused a sort of a huge uh, problem. That is the first uh, part of it. I'm very proud to see the way uh, uh, Dr. Anirudh Pandit, uh, you know, handled the situation because within no time we got geared in March 2020 as soon as the onset came, and getting on to Microsoft Teams or other devices, and then to Zoom and so on and so forth. And without interruption, I think those courses were conducted uh, by people, and they got more and more advanced as uh, one more. And also the exams, by the way, they were conducted uh, on time. Students were also given sort of options uh, to sort of, uh, you know, the way uh, they would undergo the exams. And uh, one got, I would say, uh, a sense uh, that ICT adopted it very quickly in, the, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the um, handling of the situation. As far as the future is concerned, let me tell you that it is going to be uh, it's not going to be the same as in the past. See, there is on one hand, there is a physical, that is where I attend the classrooms and we do everything, etc. On the other hand, there is a digital, where there is no classroom. Your home becomes your classroom. The truth is going to be in between. Because what is education? Education is learning, doing, and being. Learning, you can do digital. Okay? There are huge uh, sort of material that is available today. We have access to the best uh, professors in the world today, their lectures and things that. Are. But doing, you have to do things with your own hand. There is no substitute to that. Okay? And being, being is a, being a part of the society, of community. All right? Uh, the social connect, so as to say. You know, there is no substitute to a uh, warm handshake or a hug, so as to say, okay? 
And therefore, that particular part has to be there. So I would say, predict that it's not going to be physical or digital. It's going to be digital, in a sense, a mix of uh, the two. Also, one has to realize that one can take advantage of uh, the uh, new technologies to do things which were not done before. Uh, well, let me give you an example. I myself have been a teacher in Malawi. So I was um, a visiting professor at Delaware University teaching process fluid mechanics, I remember, to the undergraduate students. And uh, there I used to get bored because uh, although it was a class of 90, they would split between 30, 30, 30. So 10 to 11, 12 to 1, 2 to 3, I had to repeat the same thing. I get bored doing the same thing. So I started bringing video cassettes to the room. Let's say, sir, uh, GI Taylor's low Reynolds number had to deny this. 45 minute class, 15 minutes, I will show the video and I will distribute question papers. Okay? Now, this was a new way of doing it, and the university allowed me to do that. Why did I do that? Observation, analysis, and synthesis. How do you observe? How do you analyze what you have seen? And how do you synthesize? You know? And I remember. Uh, that year, because they do uh, evaluation, the teacher just doesn't evaluate students, students evaluate teacher. And that year, I remember in the chemical engineering department, I was ranked as number one. And I was very happy because there were giants like uh, Art Mesner and Bob Kitford and a whole range of uh, fathers of chemical engineering. You know, I was very proud. And there was one uh, remark one student had made uh, saying that uh, Professor Michelger has. Uh, showed to me, um, I mean, made me discover myself. I don't know how to thank him. Maybe I will name my firstborn child after him. Can you imagine an American student like uh, writing something like that? Now, however, if you just see, while doing that, I mean, unfair, because in a class there is a distribution of uh, intelligence. The best students will catch everything in 15 minutes. The dull students will take more time. I was not giving them an opportunity. Because there was a video cassette, only 15 minutes. Now, technology, so I don't have to use video cassette. Right? You can uh, pick up something on YouTube. And if you don't understand, you can go back and forth, back and forth. Okay? So now, technology gives you an opportunity, basically, to sort of uh, not get restricted to the amount of time you heard something in the class. With that. And now, even further, you know, I've been serving Marcus Industry Professor at uh, Monash University for 13 continuous years. And they have a department which looks at innovation and education. Now there are 30 tablets in the room, okay, where a class is being. The teacher has access to all the tablets on how they are solving the problem. So they have access to your mind in terms of what you are thinking. Previously, whether you understood or not, they will know only after the periodic test, right? That will after one month, two months, three months. Now, as it is happening, why I'm elaborating on this is that from video cassette to instant access to the tablet, you can quite clearly see. So we have to now take benefit of that. Like, for example, your interactions, okay, uh, with uh, your professors, okay? He will say, come into room 116 at 3.30, and then you are waiting outside, okay? You don't have to. If uh, the 30 students create WhatsApp group along with the teacher, you are with him 24 into 7. In fact, we did this when I was uh, uh, chairman of uh, ISER Mohali board. We said, uh, uh, let's do innovations like this. And it made a huge uh, sort of difference. We can come closer. So it's a proper bend of physical and digital that is going to be the future. And I'm quite sure just as we pride ourselves in terms of excellence in ICT, uh, uh, you know, in our teaching and research, we should pride ourselves in the best way to deliver education by blame of this physical industry. So you really gave us a optimistic view towards our online education, which has been going on. Uh, sir, you have received over 60 honors and awards have been bestowed on you. These include the highest Indian civilian awards. There have been several global awards as well. You have received over 45 honorary doctorates. What do they all mean to you? And which one do you value the most? <laughs> what do they mean to me? 
Well, all that I would say is that uh, each time you get something, what the society is saying or the institution is saying or nation is saying is, well done. But we expect more from carry on. That is how I have always interpreted it. Um, every award, every honor that one has received, one is grateful and one accepts it with humility. But there will be always something uh, uh, special. For example, in 1998, I remember, I became one of the highest award in science, that is FRS, Fellowship of Royal Society. But the same year, I got an award which is reserved only for corporates. It was called JRD Tata Corporate Leadership Award. Before me, it was uh, Narad Murthy, and after me, it was Premji. So people used to say Saraswati is sandwiched between Lakshmi and Lakshmi. <laughs> you, you see? But it is very unusual for the same person to get the highest award that is reserved for businessmen and also for scientists. That was uh, uh, very uh, interesting indeed. Uh, FRS was something very special in my life. One was because I was following my great guru. But the second is that you sign in the same book where Newton has signed. Uh, you know, so when we are uh, uh, learning Newton's uh, laws of motion, if somebody had told me that you will sign in the same book, <laughs> that would have been impossible. Or my becoming president of Institution of Chemical Engineers UK, uh, you know, I was the first uh, sort of non-English person, Indian, and that too in their golden jubilee year, basically. That was very, very uh, unusual. And I was particularly happy about it because NCL, where I was director, by the way, our own director was an Englishman 50 years ago. Okay? And after 50 years, the uh, UK's institution has an Indian. So you can see the transformation that has taken place. So that has given a joy. Uh, honorary doctors, number, I uh, 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 cherish all of them, but one I remember is uh, the South Africa, uh, Pretoria University, you know. And I remember the Vice Chancellor when he met me and greeted me, I greeted him. He said, Do you know, we normally don't give uh, honorary doctors. The last one we gave about five years ago. And you know who it was? Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. So uh, one felt uh, sort of elevated. You know, so there are moments of joy, uh, sort of uh, like this. But all of them are precious because each one of them has to well done, but we expect more from them. That's just incredible, sir. I mean, we say incredible India, and that is what your standing, your talking with us just means a lot to us. So you have been in chemical engineering field for over five decades. You have seen the world. So who is the best chemical engineer you've met in your life? Maybe you can choose one in academia and maybe in industry. Oh, that's a very tough one because I've met uh, uh, so many of them all around. Many of them have influenced uh, my life. But if I were to single out in academy, yeah, I cannot uh, think of anyone who comes even closer to my group, Professor M.M. He has been absolutely incredible. You know, at the age of 27, he became a full professor of chemical engineering. You remember that? That itself was a history. And uh, there are many, many things uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, he uh, sort of uh, has. Uh, first of all, uh, I was his student, so I have watched him from close quarters. He was a fountainhead of ideas. While I was doing PhD, every day there would be a chip on with new ideas. So by the time I had finished my PhD, there was chips like this. You know. <laughs> so in terms of new idea generation was not. The second was uh, uh, the, uh, uh, he was a pioneer because in science only those who are remembered would be the first. You know, like for example, the, I mean, as soon as you say chemical methods of determining uh, interfacial areas or mass transfer coefficients, you think of Professor Sharma. Okay? I mean, that's it. I mean, he has made a huge impact. And there are many first to his credit, like what he did in liquid liquid extraction. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to know the interfacial area. You were the first one in the world to show how chemical methods can be used. 
are these major breakthrough that uh, particles that are smaller than uh, the diffusion film thickness create uh, enormous augmentation. That was the first, that's what I mean by you are having to say so, sort of a first one. The other thing was that uh, we did our research under very difficult conditions. We did not have any resource. You know, what was my annual uh, this thing, contingency? 10,000 rupees. And within 10,000 rupees, you can imagine it is almost like 1,000 rupees per month in which we have to do everything. And I remember we used to beg and borrow. I remember I was doing work in bubble columns. Uh, okay. And uh, we needed those plastic bubble columns. I used to go to uh, Prohit, uh, his close friend, and uh, get it from him. Or we needed sulfolane. I would go with the uh, tin and get it from Nosil. So it was like begging, borrowing, and doing research. And yet we were able to produce papers which became internationally famous, you know, I mean, so as to say. The other was his value system. My first paper was Sharma and Mashilkar. The second was Mashilkar and Sharma. The third was only Mashilkar. I said, sir, uh, uh, you should put your name. He said, no, I am not going And in fact, he's the only one with such values, where in his CV, there is an attachment which says very proudly the papers published by my students on their own. You, you get the point. So those value systems were very strong. The other thing that he had was that this is, of course, what he contributed to research and lifting the standards and uh, etc. But also at a national level, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the growth of petrochemical industry, uh, I mean, it was given by Professor Sharma. He was the chairman of Science Advisory Committee, the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, for the longest number of years. And lots of things that you saw, as a matter of fact, were essentially uh, sort of because of his vision. So he had that, uh, what I would say, microscopic vision, as well as a telescopic vision. Wow. A big picture as well as a, a small picture. So I'm not... And memory, I mean, incredible. He will look at you and say, oh, uh, 1982 graduate or 1986 graduate. Wow. <laughs> incredible. In fact, you know, in Cambridge University, when you were there, uh, uh, students hardly went to the library. They would come to him and he would tell them everything. So <laughs> I remember meeting Tom Kim, who was his compatriot. And he said, when uh, uh, Shama, they would call him not Shama, but when Shama left, nobody knew where the library was <laughs> because <laughs> they're not. So I think uh, there is only one uh, Manmohan Sharma uh, that uh, gets born uh, in a while, you know. Like they said about Lata, you know, there can be only one Lata. Like that, there can be only those of Manmohan Sharma. As far as the industry is concerned, undisputably it is Mukesh, Mukesh Amba. I work very, very closely with him. What a vision, audacious vision, you know. And if you see the way Glance has grown under his leadership, it is incredible. But you ask me about a chemical engineer. You know, his deepest understanding of chemical engineering principles. He always talks about first principles, by the way. He always talks about first principles. And it is very difficult. I mean, one is scared to actually meet him because he he is capable of uh, deep diving to such an extent it asks you the uh, toughest of questions. He studied, do you know when he enters a new business, for example, when he, uh, he took online courses. He wanted wow. to do Algito oil, for example. And as you know, in um, uh, ICT, we are not very well known for biology. We hardly learn any biology. So he said, I don't know biology, I will learn biology. And he learned biology to an extent where there was a discussion on Algito oil. The great experts had come. He asked them questions that uh, they did not know. And he said things that they did not know. So he's incredible. And his grand vision, like uh, what he has done for Joe, now he wants to do for green energy. On the other day, I had a, a fireside chat with him in our Asia Economic Dialogue. It's a 35-minute talk. Please have a look at it. It's fantastic. Sure. And he unravels the vision of India becoming in future the Saudi Arabia of new energy, exporting half a trillion dollar worth of green energy 
to the rest of the world. You wow. know, and he has put a target of one, one, one. Just like he said, voice free. No. Mm-hmm. Similarly, he has put a target of one, one, one. You know what is one, one, one? One dollar for one kg of hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen in one decade, maybe for a billion. You one billion. Audacious, and he will make it happen. You know. So I can't uh, uh, in my life, uh, even if I look at the whole world that I looked at, can't find two people in academia better than Professor Amit Sharma and in industry better than Mukesh Ambani. And we at ICT should be very, very, very proud. Yes, so we are truly proud. This is just amazing. So my last question to you would be that I read you see India as a leading advanced nation in the near future. What are some of the tips which you would like to give us, the young generation? In other words, while ending, what Mashelkar mantras would you like to leave behind for the yeah, young yeah, sure, sure, sure. I often repeated these uh, Mashelkar mantras in my convocation address and so on. Uh, but all good things have to be repeated, so let me repeat them. I think the first and foremost for you young people is to keep your aspirations high because they are your possibilities. If you aim at Everest, at least you will reach Kanchanganga. But if you aim at Kanchanganga, you'll be at Hanuman Tekri. And Hanuman Tekri, if you aim at, you'll be on the ground. So keep your aspirations high. That's number one. Number two, is that particularly for young people, I want to say that like instant coffee, there's no instant success. We want, the young generation wants success immediately. You know, it cannot. There's no substitute to hard work. Okay. I will be touching 80 now on 1st January. But I work 24 into 7, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And will continue to do so till the last year. So no substitute. Only my request is work hard in silence. Let success make all the noise. Don't no start making noise. The third is purpose, perseverance, and passion. You must have big purpose, not just for yourself or your family mm-hmm. or your institution, for the nation. Not start. Dhruvatara. Perseverance is very important. It is too early to give up. Winners are never quitters. Quitters are never winners. You will fail on the way. What is the spelling of fail? F-A-I-L. What does F-A-I-L mean? First attempt in learning. You have to learn. Your best guru is your last mistake. As long as you learn from it. So remember that. The fourth one is uh, you will keep on knocking on the doors or window of opportunity and they don't open. Then you get frustrated. Don't do that. When those doors don't open, open your own doors. Create your own doors. You'll say, I don't understand. How do you do? I'll tell you. 1976, I came back to Tennessee from UK. Today, we are a $2,000 GDP. That time we were $100. Very poor country. We didn't have foreign exchange. So I want an equipment called Weisenberg Reorganiometer to do my rheology and non Newtonian film effects. I will get it. Two years it would take. Digital clearance, not manufactured in India, certificate. So that door was not opening. I said, I'm not getting that equipment, but what equipment has God given me? This my brain. Mm-hmm. So I said, I will use it. And I went into what is called as modeling and simulation. 1977, I started my work. And whatever work I did there, in five years time, 1982, I got the Bhatnagar Prize, which is the highest prize, uh, as you know, for uh, 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 scientists below 45. Okay. Now, supposing because that equipment was not coming, and that door was not opening, I was just waiting for that equipment to come for two years. What would I have to do? Mm. So I created my own. Similarly, that's what we And the final part is there's no limit to human achievement. There's no limit to human 
uh, endurance, there's no limit to human imagination, excepting the limit you put yourself. So go limitless. Now you would say, can you explain? I'll explain. So I remember when I got FRS, as you know, it's one of the highest honors. In, now currently, I mean, there have been only three engineering scientists who got FRS. Professor Sharma, Professor Rudam Narsimha, and me. Out of Professor Rudam Narsimha, unfortunately, has passed away. So there are only two in 360 years. So it's a big honor, no? Yes. I remember calling Professor Sienara, who has been um, both Professor Sharma's guru as well as my guru. He also calls him guru. So uh, he's a Mahaguru, <laughs> so as to say. And he has been my mentor and so on. So I said, sir, I'll become a therapist. I thought he will come there. He said, he just said, well, not bad. So it was one of the things that happens every day. Then I got some other honors, which were also unique, you know, uh, including US National Academy of Inventors. I was the first Indian to get it. Uh, uh, you would just say, not bad. Then one day I got very upset when he said, not bad. He said, sir, what do I have to do mm -hmm. to impress you? And what he said, I like to leave behind. So he said, Mr. you are climbing on a ladder of excellence, which is limitless. No limit, excepting the limit you put on. What does that mean? It means, in other words, that no matter what you get in life, you have to say, my best is yet to come. All right? And at the end, I would say, what you should do, whether you are 18 or 88, when you get up in the morning, every day in the morning, you should say, my best is yet to come. And maybe today is the day it will come. Remember, even at 88. Okay? And when I say my best is yet to come, not just for me, but for my nation. I will continue to do that. And yes. you can just imagine if 1.3 billion Indians do it. What a great country India would be. So these would be my five machine governments. Very simple. First is aspiration, second is hard work, third is purpose, perseverance, passion, fourth is creating your own doors, and finally, going limitless in terms of imagination, in terms of performance. So this was a very interesting session. Uh, and I personally feel that we, uh, I hope we live up to your expectation by following your Mashalgar mantras and the wishes that you have for our institution, I hope they come true. And with this, we come to an end of the talk. It was indeed an insightful and extremely delightful session, especially for the young technologists out there. Also, your advices will truly be a motivation for the budding researchers and soon to be technologists. And I hope the session was as inspiring for our view viewers as it was for me. And so personally, I learned a lot about this wonderful journey. And last but not least, I would like to extend my gratitude to you for taking out your valuable time for, from this busy schedule of yours. And also, I would like to thank Bombay Technologies and ICT for giving me this great opportunity.